Good day, so glad you're joining us and what a privilege it is to be able to bring God's word literally to the world. So I don't know where you are, but why don't you just drop a comment, let us know where you are and who you are so we can interact and engage with you. But yeah, just thank you for joining us and thank you that, you know, when we're done here, that you'll share this message with other people that need to hear it. Right, so I've got this message today um, on, man, it's a topic that is something I battle with and so many of us battle with it. Uh, but I also believe today it's gonna, we're going to be overcome and we're also going to be released. So stick with, listen to the end, you're going to be pleasantly surprised. Right, can we just close our eyes quickly. Lord, thank you so much for this word. Thank you for your living word. Thank you that you are a living God and that we have got a life to live because of the life that you gave. May that life just bring power and may it bear much fruit, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, awesome. Uh, if you had to ask 100 people this question, okay, and I guess about 60, 70, maybe even up to 75, 80% of people would all answer the same. And the question is this, what is your number one weakness? We expect people to say sin or whatever, but honestly, most people are going to say patience. I don't lack patience, or I don't have patience, I seriously lack patience. Yeah, I am guilty as charged. And it's something I'm aware of. I know I've got this, this fruit on my tree and it's, 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 it hasn't developed. It's still small. In fact, I'm sure it's ready to drop off to the ground and die and rot. But I know it's there. I know patience or the ability to have patience is within me. I just have to exercise that patience because impatience has been the cause of the fall of many men and women and they've caused so much damage so much stuff all because of a little thing called patience now when it comes to being impatient with other people you know what i relate i really do some people have got this amazing ability to find your little impatient button and press it continuously. While it may be okay, but it's not really, to have impatience with people. Lacking patience when it comes to God and the things of God, well, that's not good at all. Because when you lack patience with God, you know, it, it erodes your relationship it undermines your belief and it actually destroys the hope that you have in Christ if there's one thing this one thing we need to learn it is to have patience with God we need to learn to simply wait on God and I believe we need to wait in three areas okay one is when it comes to our land and it doesn't matter where you live God is going to answer those prayers we don't know when but man I can't believe that any of our countries are going to go completely to the dogs the other two is we need patience when it comes to the answering of our prayers and when we talk about prayers you know some answers come quickly and some take a long time to come and some don't even come that's also an answer uh, I, I, I was reading in the week um, V and I were doing our devotionals and part of the devotion was from the book of Daniel and in chapter 9 of um, Daniel yeah, it was chapter 9 um, he's praying and immediately an angel appears and says your prayers have been heard he has the answer and one chapter later we read Daniel praying again 
And he says, I've been praying for three weeks. And after three weeks, an angel shows up and says, man, we heard your prayer, but I've been fighting my way through to get here to you. You see, Daniel had to be patient. Sometimes answers to prayers are going to take a little longer, but we've got to hang in there. But it's the third aspect that I believe we need to take to heart today. And I'm going to lead into it by establishing this fact. You, if you declare that you are a believer, if you've given your heart to Jesus, then I believe you have got the call of God on your life. Every single believer is called into full-time ministry and it happened when you said yes to Jesus. And if you go read the Bible, this is your ministry. To do good, to love others, and to make disciples. And it's because we're not doing these three that the world largely looks like it does. But we all need to enter into ministry. Some just blaze their way. Others have just sat back and waited and done nothing. But today, I want to talk to you about getting there, getting past the barriers and getting into the harvest field. And I'm going to ask you that today you pray, Lord, release me. That you pray, Lord, I'm a harvester. I know there's a harvest. I know you control the harvest, but release me into the harvest field. When it's my turn, when you have made me ready, when you have equipped me, Lord, release me. You've got to wait until God says, go. Okay? Look here. we got a world. It looks like it's going to the dogs. We've got people that don't acknowledge Jesus. We've got all of these things. And we as believers need to start doing what God called us to do. But if we don't wait for God to say, go, we're going to do damage. Now, I was, I was, I was reading a, a blog by a, a place called Crosswalk. Man, and they were just talking about this patience, this waiting on God. And um, it just opened up so many things to me. Now, one of the hardest things to do is to wait on the Lord. In Psalm 27, verse 14, it says, Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. You got this, the sandwich. And you got, be strong on the one, the one slice. Take courage, the other. And patience makes the sandwich. We've got to wait on God so he can release us. And sometimes it's, it's, it's not easy. It gets difficult and we get frustrated. But if you go in your own strength, oh my goodness, you're probably going to have mediocre success. You're probably going to burn yourself out. You're going to get despondent. You're going to get down on yourself. Some of you might even backslide and leave the faith when you don't see results, because that's what happens. Some people, however, are scared and they're immature. They're not ready to go. While well, we got people on the other end of the scale that are so eager to go and they can't sit and wait. They just want to get things done. And I'm one of them. I'm a type of like, climb out of the boat, walk on the water type of people. But I've had to learn patience when it comes to the things of God. Ask, how many times have I said, we can't just sit here and do nothing. And I'm sure I'm talking to the right people this morning. Some of you said that. But the problem is, then you're running ahead of God. Yes, the will of God. Yes, where you are far ahead instead of being incorporated into the will and the way of God. You know, we make a plan, we get things done. Does it sound familiar? But often we fail because we're ahead of God. 
Does God expect you to go? Yes. He expects every believer to go. But only when he gives you the go ahead. And this is what we need to wait for. You see, only the Spirit of the Lord, listen, only the Spirit of the Lord can tell the child of the Lord whether it's time to rise up and act or to sit there and wait. You got to hear from God. And I know sometimes, you know, waiting feels like you're doing nothing. But believe me, it's in this time that you are being prepared, you're being equipped, you're being matured. It's in this time you need to be part of a life-giving church. You need to be part of a, of a vibrant life group, connect group, small group, whatever you call it. So you're being discipled and you're being prepared. It's during this time you've got to get into the Word and you've got to get the Word into you so that you can go out and you can be fruitful in your faithfulness. Okay, so let's look at an example from the Bible. And we're going to be drifting between Acts, Acts 9 to 11. So you can open there. I'm going to quote some of the scriptures. You can go through them. You can highlight them. But we're talking about this newly saved um, and, and this recently called guy, young firebrand called Saul of Tarsus. And he's been like destroying everybody who believes in Jesus. And now he's filled with the power of Jesus and wants to convert everybody. But he hasn't learned to wait on the Lord. And he's going to learn it the hard way. And we don't want the hard way for you. We don't want you to be forced into learning the hard way. Now, so let's look at Saul. You know, after he was saved... We read in Acts 9.20, it says that immediately he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. So he gets saved, he starts preaching. Okay? And many, many, let's call them newbies, maybe a derogatory term. Let's call the new to the faith, the new people of the way, you know, whatever. Um, many of us are like that. I was like that. I was filled with zeal and I wanted to rush out, but I had no knowledge. But man, I had all of this passion and I wanted to preach and teach and I got worn out because I wasn't seeing the results and I was scaring people off. And I soon faded away. And a lot of us become like that because God hasn't released us yet. Now Saul, he was a powerful preacher. He had the truth and he knew what he had. But evidently, he was short on a couple of things like humility, like kindness, like patience. Wherever he preached, you can go and read these accounts. Fights broke out. It says in Acts 9, 22, 23, he confounded the Jews in Damascus because he had the truth. And then it goes on to say, and the Jews plotted to kill him. Okay? In Acts 9.29, he disputed against the Hellenists, that's the Greek believers, and as a result, they attempted to kill him. So, I mean, he disputed. He was arguing with them. He doesn't have the, the knowledge of the things of God because it hasn't been matured through the things of God. So he's in arguments and they want to kill him. And if you go in and you, you look at how he preached it, it's like he took no prisoners. He wasn't making converts. He was making enemies. And so the church in Jerusalem looks at this young believer and thinks, we, we better intervene. We better rescue this brother. They, well, they want to protect him. So they get him out of town and they bring him down to... Caesarea, and from there they send him back to his home in Tarsus. This bright young rabbinical student has to go back home. And in this crosswalk article, it explains this part so nicely, and I'm going to try and do that justice. 
What did Saul's mom and dad and his brothers and his sisters think when Saul returned home completely different to what he left there? Can you imagine them thinking, man, we paid good money for this boy. We, we, we put him through a binnacle school in Jerusalem. And now he comes home and he's got nothing to show for his education. He's got nothing to show for all the money we spent. I mean, for goodness sake, we even spent extra money so that Gamaliel could teach him. And what did he do? He knows the truth. He's been taught by the best and he decides to follow some carpenter's son who was crucified and even though he, he, he is dead, he still follows him. What is up with that boy? And now he's moved into his room again and he eats like a horse. He's making tents for a living with all that knowledge. Is making tents. Can you imagine Saul going to the markets or going to visit family and friends? How they would have been speaking about him, questioning him, asking him, Saul, what's up, brother? What's going on with you? I mean, you left here yeah, something else. What you what you've returned as we don't understand. What is wrong with you? So he gets stuck back in Tarsus. And I don't know how long it took before Barnabas showed up and Barnabas asked Saul to join him in Tarsus. Some people say up to 10 years. 10 years of waiting. 10 years of being equipped, of being prepared. And I can almost sort of relate because, you know, when, when I was saved, the day I was saved, I had this vision of me standing before a crowd of people preaching. And man, I couldn't wait. I was going to be a pastor. I was going to be an evangelist. Eight years passed. Eight years before I got confirmation of the call. And another two years after that, before I got the release to now go, I had to be prepared. Had I gone earlier, man, I would have failed the king. I would have failed the king's people, which is you. If I had followed my head and my heart, I wouldn't have been here today but when God said go then it worked and I believe God is telling many of you listening and are going to hear this message it's time to go or it's time to wait and be equipped it's time for me to work in you so I can send you now obviously during this time Saul he was to become Paul, as you know. Um, it looks like he was faithful because when Barnabas showed up, he was ready to go and he was effective immediately. And what had happened, a revival had broke out in Antioch, which is in modern day Syria. And um, so what was remarkable was that all of these Gentiles, you know, those are people who, who are non-Jews, of following a Jewish saviour, this Jesus. And they're coming to them in their droves. I mean, revival had broken out. And the church in Jerusalem hears about this. Now they want to know, is this the real deal? So they send their then number one guy, Barnabas. And, you know, people refer to Barnabas as the encourager. And they send him to go and check, first of all, if it is real, and if it's a real man, to get into it and to get involved into it. And it says in Acts 11, 23 for 20 and 24, this is now speaking about Barnabas. It says, he was glad and encouraged them all 
that with the purpose of heart they should continue with the Lord. We read, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith. And then we get one of the greatest, often ignored sentences in the New Testament. And it's in Acts 11, 25. It says, And then Barnabas departed for Tarsus to seek Saul. If Saul, get this now, if Saul had not waited, there would be no Paul. Without Paul, there would be none of the missionary journeys. Without the missionary journeys, there'll be no churches. Without the churches, there'd be no letters. For sure, God would have used someone else. But he wanted to use Saul, or now Paul. But Paul waited. And his patience is our prize. Because he waited, we have got the Word of God. We got the way of God. We know the will of God. And we've got the instructions that come from God. All because this new convert decided, I've got to wait. He's this new man, the man of the moment, Paul. He absorbs this news of the revival. And can you imagine how he responded when, when um, Barnabas shows up? I don't even think if it's anything like I imagine him to be that he had time to kiss mama and papa goodbye, that he even packed clothes. I think he was like off in a flash, say, let's go. The time has come. We're going to fall heaven. And I'm sure he rushed off. And we know that mighty things happened and exciting things happened. And there's nothing more exciting in life like knowing the waiting period is over and that you are now in a place that God has prepared for you, doing the work that He has in store for you. There's nothing better knowing that you've been prepared, you've been equipped. You've had the potter work the clay of your life to make something beautiful, to get, to get rid of all the deformities, everything that doesn't fit, so that you would be effective on the harvest field. This Paul, Saul, who was preaching in Antioch, was far removed from the young man that they had to protect in Jerusalem and send home to Tarsus so he could stop doing damage. In him there's this, this, this new love, there's this, this kindness, there's a depth of compassion and there's way more effectiveness. In fact, we see him preaching not only from passion, but from love now as well. And in, even in Ephesians 4.15 it says, Speak the truth in love, because he had learned this while he was waiting on God. The waiting was the maturing work. And waiting is hard. Waiting is really hard. But waiting is fruitful. Now as with Paul, you know, with the waiting time. He, he, he must have suffered very hard, uh, many hardships while at home, making tents, having the family laugh at him, having people in Tarsus question him. And you might be going through hardships. You know, there might be a barrenness in your heart, uh, in your life. There might be discouragement in your heart. You might even have unemployment or severe opposition or you've been doing some soul searching where is God why am I waiting is all of this real why am I being left in this place for so 
long. And I want to tell you today, child of God, be faithful. Wait. When God says go, you go. In Romans 8 it says, this is Paul writing, the very same Paul, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the gl glory that is to be, re to be revealed in us. So you know you're waiting, all the stuff you're going through is nothing compared to what is going to be happening in you and through you if you learn to wait on God. Even in the book of James it says, you know, James 5, 7 to 8, you can go, go, go read it there. It says, be patient. Be patient. Establish your hearts. Okay? James is saying to us, learn to wait on God. Do you know what happens to those who learn to wait? Well, first of all, they get released. Okay? But it says this in the book of Isaiah. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That is the qualities we need of the harvesters on the harvest field. And this is what waiting produces. So, I want to ask you, have you allowed yourself to be matured? Have you allowed yourself to be discipled? Are you declaring yourself to be faithful, available and teachable? Have you submitted to a local body, a church? Are you willing to be released and if that's you I want you to make a declaration today that Lord I am ready to rise up and then you decide today I'm waiting I'm tuning my ear to the heart of the Lord because I want to hear when he says go and then I'm going to go. I'm going to go on to this harvest field. I'm going to do good. I'm going to love others. I'm going to make disciples. I'm going to fulfill the word of the Lord in the lives of others as it has been fulfilled in me. I realize God is choosing me, has chosen me, to go out there and to touch others. The world needs believers who are ready to go, ready to be launched, ready to change other lives. But you have to wait first and you have to learn the waiting is because you are being prepared. And only prepared people can go out in the power of the King and be effective. I know there's a harvest coming because you are getting onto the harvest field. So go out, touch lives, only after you've waited on God and you've heard him say, go. Amen. Thank you for joining us. Really pray you've taken this to heart and you've allowed it to change you, to make, motivate you, and to become part of your training ground. We love you. Eager to see you face to face. Awesome to see you on the harvest field. Going to be a blessing. Thank you again.